Ma c'è una dor, tu il tove. Ma c'è una dor. Ma ti dici la fa. That's it, yeah. Can all the volunteers here, um, yeah, the, the, the Yes Cafe, um, they do a tremendous amount of work to just keep this thing going and keep it afloat. Um, and it's all tireless and, and it's only on the basis of the commitment to a cause. Uh, it's not about becoming rich, it's, it's, it's about keeping a cause and keeping the ideas going. So well done to each and every one of them, all the volunteers and, and to Mike. Um, I'm going to say a few words. Oh, um, oh, sorry, yeah, I, I didn't know what happened. Paul, Paul was going to make it, Paul. I was, in fact, I spoke to him last night, he was coming, so... The car was crashed, that's it. Oh, All right, he's with the police just now. Uh, hopefully he's no, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no in any bother, but uh, he's, uh, he, his car was trashed last night, apparently. But I, I spoke to him about 7 or 8 o'clock, and he was looking forward to coming through tonight, so uh, today and tonight. Um, so I hope he's not been injured by that. Um, but we're going to have a, a wee question and answer, a wee, wee session uh, on the basis of the election coming up and the, the idea of a strategic approach to, to, to that election. Um, but before we do that, we're going to have June here, who has been thrown in at the proverbial <laughs> deep end. The deep end. The good thing, the good thing is, unlike most people who can't swim. June can swim. Uh, she is new to the movement as a whole, um, and that she, up until the referendum campaign, I think, would, would say that she wasn't a political animal, so to speak. But the referendum, as it did with thousands of people, has made her a political animal and got her involved in a political campaign, and, and she's been an absolute stalwart of the independence movement uh, throughout that whole referendum and is determined not to get back in the box. Uh, she's de determined to, to keep fighting for ordinary people and for our community. So June's going to say a few uh, wee words. Um, as I say, we're throwing her in the deep end, so um, she's not got a prepared script or anything like that. Uh, I'll then say a few words and then we'll have some questions and answer them. We'll hopefully have a, a good day and then we'll have Kevin uh, playing some um, marvellous music. Okay, so June. Hi everybody, as Tommy said, please be gentle with me because I have no idea that I would sit here talking. I just came along here, can you play and listen to Tommy speak? Um, and I suppose all I can do is give you a personal perspective. People have, over the years when I've made comment and got angry about things and, and expressed my opinion, have said to me over and over again, oh you're really political. And I always rallied against that and said, no, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not being political. I'm just saying how I feel when I think that <coughs> something's not right. Um, the referendum came upon us, and for me, it was about, I have two granddaughters, um, and it was really about, I want Scotland to be the strongest country that it can be. I'm also someone who is absolutely horrified at what the, the Westminster government is inflicting upon the UK as a whole. Um, I think that the Scottish government, in fact I don't think, I know that the Scottish government <coughs> did a lot to mitigate <coughs> against the damage that was being done by policy, by Westminster policy. Um, that I, hadn't, I had never ever ever been part of a political party my immediate reaction after the referendum was to become a member of the SNP, which I did. However, I think there's a huge difference now in Scotland in politics because I may have become a member of the SNP, but that doesn't mean I'm going to blindly, loyally follow them, regardless of what they're saying and what they're doing. Having listened and watched, I'm now unsure whether that's exactly the, the, the political party that I wanted to be affiliated with. Having been at quite a few Tommy's Hope Over Fear events and actually really taking the time to listen to myself and my gut and my heart, I ha and, and, and also I'm someone who's always sort of pulled back from anybody putting any kind of label on me. I've always been very wary of somebody slapping a label on me. I have to face facts. I am a socialist. 
I'm an absolute socialist. I just didn't realise. Um, so, you know, my next sort of natural affiliation would be with solidarity. I personally really, really back the call for people to lend their vote to the SNP. And I actually, Tommy and I disagree on one new thing. Tommy says, vote with your head in the general election, and then in 2016, vote with your heart. I actually think it's the other way around. I am voting with my heart in the general election. I am voting for Scotland. I'm voting for the future of Scotland, my grandchildren, my nieces, my nephews. I'm voting on behalf of my grandparents and my parents, whom the Labour Party have completely and utterly betrayed. We've been betrayed by Labour because we have this thing about blind loyalty to political parties. And I could sit here and blame Jim Murphy and you at Joanne Lamont and all of them, but actually I think we have to take some responsibility for what happened. We got so comfortable and we placed 100% trust in a political party that over the years has completely veered away from what the Labour Party was, as far as I'm concerned, how they have the audacity to stand up and say that a working class party is beyond me. There are people out there that absolutely get it, you know, who, who have affiliations to other political parties. And it is really, really difficult to go, well, actually, I'm not going to place my vote with that party. I'm going to place it on the shoulders of the SNP. People are concerned about some SNP policies. Some I completely agree with, others I don't. The, 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 ma the fact of the matter is, we need to give them a chance. We need to bring them right out into the forefront. Give them a chance to show us exactly what they are and what they stand for. And if they're not what they are, or what we think they are, and they're not standing for us, there are other political parties who are. And that's really the, the, the sort of gist of what I want to say. I know I have people surrounding me who need jet reaction, went to a political party, but we're listening and we're watching, and I don't think the politicians get that. And every time they open their mouths, they actually insult me. They insult me, they insult my country, and they insult my family. Because it's not the SNP who are going to hold this one and that one to account. It is the Scottish people, and I think What I'm asking people to do, trust the Scottish people. We know what is best for us and what is best for our families. Another we add on I'd like to put is, I have worked in the voluntary sector in Edinburgh for 15 years. As a voluntary sector worker, involved and have been involved in working with the most vulnerable people for 15 years, we are watching welfare reform coming from this side, squashing people in our communities. And then we've got these cuts coming to our services, and it terrifies me, quite frankly. And we have to do something about it. So I'm now happy to be labelled. I'm happy to be political. I'm actually quite ashamed of myself that I wasn't I felt I was doing what I could do through work and just looking after my family and my friends and my neighbours. We have to take that further now. This is political, this is about families and this is about what Scotland wants. So. Well, I've got to say folks, I've been involved in um, frontline politics probably for about 30 odd years. I was in the parliament for eight years and I was in the council chambers in Glasgow for 11 years. Um, and I sat 
and I witnessed members of parliament and councillors who quite frankly could hardly string two words together unless somebody <laughs> gave a prepared speech. <laughs> well, just listen to our women to God. I got up at the last minute after being uh, asked if she turned up today and she's given you a fantastic rendition of her feelings and, and what's motivating her and I think that all goes well for the future, not just for June personally but for the people that hopefully June will want to represent uh, in her area as I'm sure she will do. I, um, I want to take up that whole idea, that theme about our future and, and how our future is looking secure because I had the great pleasure yesterday of being invited into a primary school in the south side of Glasgow, St George's Primary School in Penalee uh, and I'd been invited in because this primary school have started a campaign to raise awareness of child poverty and they are raising um, money and raising food donations and very vitally, they're also collecting babies' stuff, like nappies and, and wipes and things, for local food banks. Um, now, obviously we can all be absolutely disgusted that there's the existence of food banks, of course we can. But while they are there, the idea that a local primary school of 45 primary 5 and primary 6 year olds who were sitting in this wee assembly uh, room yesterday firing questions at me about poverty, about inequality, about low pay, and then probably the most uplifted part of the meeting, apart from the social conscience that they displayed, was they were asking about nuclear weapons. And when we lad, uh, we aided, said, Tommy, do you agree that it's wrong to have children in poverty and spend millions on nuclear weapons. <laughs> and I just thought, you know, this is a, a young lad, 10 years of age, raising a question that should shame politicians, particularly the Labour politicians, I have to say, some of the Tory politicians, you can't shame them, but in terms of some of the, the Labour politicians, the Margaret Currens of the world, who represent constituencies with 43% child poverty, apart from being prepared to vote for 100 billion pounds to be spent in the next generation of nuclear weapons. Absolutely shocking, totally and utterly unacceptable. But what I found yesterday was that I was completely uplifted by the fact that these youngsters, this, this new generation, the next generation, were sitting there discussing with me the rights of the child, the UN Convention on Children's Rights to Education, to shelter, to food, to water, and they were putting me on the spot about how we have to fight to get rid of nuclear weapons in order to feed the children. Apparently, the day before, they had the MP, Ian Davidson, and the MSP, John Lamont, in the school, and according to the teachers, I probably shouldn't say this out loud, um, they were put on the spot and they were given a hard time by these youngsters. And one of the things they were given a hard time about was nuclear weapons, but the other thing they were given a hard time about was the referendum. Um, so, from my point of view, that was extremely, extremely encouraging to hear youngsters. I can remember, some of you will be able to remember what you were like at primary six at school. And I've got to uh, shamefully say I wasn't involved in any way, shape or form, uh, interested in politics at the age of 10 years of age. I was interested in football, uh, that was my, my biggest interest and probably my only interest. But here I was. Uh, among these youngsters, all of them, all their hands up, it was incredible, we didn't have enough to end up running out of time and we couldn't get all the questions in. Every one of them eloquent and very, very determined that we should be tackling poverty. So from, from my point of view, folks, that tells me that we're in moving in the right direction. I think what's happened since the Scottish Parliament was born in 1999, I think what's happened is the sense of identity, Scottish identity, has increased incredibly. I would argue that up until the Scottish Parliament, then there was a huge sense of Scottish identity. Of course there was, but there wasn't a focus for it. There, there, there wasn't a, a, an organised uh, development of it. I would argue that since the Scottish Parliament, because I've done 
absolutely hundreds of visits to schools since the Scottish Parliament, particularly in my role as an MSP before. And what was clear is that people recognise, wait a minute, we are a country. That's why we've got a parliament. And as soon as people realise we're a country, then they don't just want a parliament. They want to be able to run our affairs. They want to be able to take the decisions that affect everybody's life. And from that point of view, I believe fundamentally, as I said, on the uh, BBC show uh, a couple of days after the referendum when uh, I think it was Andrew Neil or somebody was putting to me, oh, but you lost the vote, you lost the vote. And I said, well, you know, we may have to take a wee detour, but we're still on the path to independence. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I was encouraged just recently there at the weekend with the latest uh, opinion um, survey that was conducted, uh, I think it was at Edinburgh University, and it involved something like opinions from 10,000 people. So this isn't something that's just 100 people getting phoned up randomly. Some 10,000 people surveyed across Scotland, and the conclusion is that if a referendum was to be held tomorrow, then it would be 69% in favour of independence. So that shows you the change that's taken place, even in this short few months since September. Massive change. People realising, hey, we were bullied, we were lied to, we were conned, we're not having it any longer. You know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Don't allow ourselves to be fooled again. I think that is the attitude of most people. I was looking at some figures um, in preparation for today and for tonight's meeting, and one of the statistics which really stuck in my head was in 1990, in relation to the share of the UK's national wealth, all of the goods and services that are produced and sold, the share of the wealth, 65% of the wealth, used to go to workers in their wages. So the 65% goes to wages, 35% goes to profit. The figures now is 50% going to wages, 50% going to profit. It's the lowest share of the national wealth going to wages since records began. People say, oh but Tommy, average wages are now rising. You hear the government spokespeople all the time, oh average wages are now rising, we're out of recovery. And of course what that hides is average wages include chief executives include the bankers. The figures are in my, my, my folder here. The average wage of your chief executive in Britain in the last year has increased by 34%. The average wage for bankers has increased by 14%. The average wage for members of parliament has increased by 11%. Average wage for nurses, 1%. Average wage for teachers, 1%. Average wage for armed forces, 1%. Average wage um, for uh, police officers, 0%. So in other words, in amongst this idea of, oh, average wages are increasing, it's actually illusory. Average wages include the bosses. And it's the bosses' wages that are increasing that drag that figure up. The reality is, for the overwhelming majority of ordinary people, Wages are not only not rising, but in real terms, when you've got inflation running at 3%, if your wages have gone up 1%, that's a 2% wage cut. That's the reality. The figure, the other figure that Prem Sika, who's a professor of accounts down at Essex University, he does a marvellous amount of research. And he looked at the figure in 1990, the figure of the differentiation between the average worker's wage and the average boss's wage at the top 100 FTSE index companies. And in 1990, the differential was 60 to 1. So a, a, a boss of one of the top 100 companies wages 60 times more uh, the average wage of an ordinary worker. So the, the, the bosses of Tesco are getting paid 60 times more money than those that are sat in the shelves and those that are serving at the, at the counters. Absolute disgraceful. Absolute disgraceful differentiation, absolute disgraceful. The differentiation now isn't 61. Differentiation now is 160 to 1. 160 to 1. The average salary now of the bosses 
and the top 100 companies is 4.7 million pounds. 4.7 million pounds. Average wage across UK right now, 27,000. Many, many hundreds of thousands are getting paid less than that. We have got the reality of wages of an average character of 16, 15,000 in Scotland. That's why, that's why we've got the reality in Drum Chapel in Bear's Den, cheek by Joe, where the life expectancy in Drum Chapel is 12 years less than a life expectancy in Bear's Den, despite the fact that you can walk 20 yards and go from one place to the other. Because people born into poverty have got less life chances, have got less life expectancy. I was watching the, the news today, even just this morning, and I, I'm not familiar, as familiar with Edinburgh as I am with Glasgow, but they've now produced the same, the same type of survey, saying that one part of Edinburgh, which is only a mile away from another part of Edinburgh, the life expectancy difference is 11 years. 11 years, one mile, 11 years. That's the grotesque reality of what poverty brings. It lowers expectations, it lowers the spirit, and it lowers uh, the life expectancy. I think we have to be involved in the campaign for independence, not because we want to change the Union Jack fluttering above the Edinburgh Municipal Buildings to a St Andrews flag, because if that's all we change, then it's not going to have been worthwhile. What we want to change isn't it just the flag. We want to change the level of wages. We want to change the pension. We want to change life expectancy. We want to change the reality of grinding poverty, which is a scar in Scotland. A scar. It's not our fault. We want to fight to change it. The way I think we're going to change it is by delivering our independence in order that we then get the tools to build a new and a better Scotland, a fairer Scotland, a Scotland that doesn't spend millions on nuclear weapons but spends it in schools and hospitals instead. A Scotland that raises the living wage, not the bloody minimum wage that people can't live on anyway. We introduce a living wage in recognition of the fact, folks, if you pay people a decent wage, I want to do away with this term, I hate this term, you hear it in the news all the time, the working poor, <laughs> the working poor, <laughs> see if you're working, why the hell are you poor? Exactly. We should have in Scotland a living wage so that every person that's working does they need to rely on benefits, whether it's housing benefit, working families tax credit, council tax benefit, what are all those benefits? Those benefits are subsidies to big business. People say, oh, you know, we can't have, I was debating on the radio last week with uh, Alan Cochran for the, the Telegraph and was talking about, oh, we, we, we can't subsidise people all the time, we, we can't have Scotland, it's just a big benefit subsidy country. And I said, wait a minute, who's been subsidised here with benefits? We don't subsidise working class people with benefits, we subsidise big business because they don't pay enough wages and the recognition that the state will pick up the slack. Yeah. Those workers that are only getting paid enough, oh, don't worry about it, we don't need to pay them. They'll get their housing benefit, they'll get their working families tax, they'll get their council tax benefit. We don't need to pay wages, we can just keep counting our profits. Well, I've got to say, in an independent Scotland, we should be introducing laws which legislate for a living wage for every single worker. Why would that be a good idea? Because when you're getting a higher wage, what are the majority of people going to do with a higher wage? They're not going to bury it in the garden. <laughs> They're going to spend it. They're going to spend it in goods and services which creates more demand in the economy, which creates more supply of jobs in the economy, which creates even more demand in the economy. It's a win-win cycle. I often at meetings talk about the marginal propensity to consume, which sounds a mouthful, but it's a basics of economics. Marginal propensity to consume. Give a pound extra a week to a millionaire, it's unproductive. Why? Because a millionaire's not going to spend that extra pound, because they've already got everything they need in life. They're not going to, that pound's going in the bank, so that pound isn't creating a thing. Give an extra pound to a pensioner. Give an extra pound to a worker. 
give an extra pound to an ordinary family, it's productive. Why? Because they'll spend it. That's the approach I think we need in the new Scottish economy that we're going to create in an independent Scotland, where people become much more important than profit. I think that's the prize that we should be seeking, that we, in years to come, in generations to come, it's not going to happen overnight, we know that, but you know, I've greatly been inspired throughout my life by the likes of Martin Luther King. I have a dream when he talks about looking forward to a future one day where the children will say to their parents, what was racism? Well, you know what? I think we should have a dream. A dream that in the future in an independent Scotland, their children will say to the parents, what was poverty? What was nuclear weapons? What was inequality? What was damp housing? That's the type of things that I think should keep us inspired and keep us going. I think in the short term, six weeks from now, that's all it is, six weeks from now, we've got a general election. And I would argue this is a completely and utterly unique general election. There are some people in here who are more mature than me, can I say politely? <laughs> some of you will be less mature. <laughs> But for those of you who are more mature, I think I can say without fear of contradiction, never in your lifetime has there been a general election in Scotland where it looks like the SNP could win it. Never. It's just never happened. And yet we have, within six weeks, the opportunity to win Scotland for independence, to win Scotland for unilateral nuclear disarmament, to win Scotland for an anti-austerity set of policies. A set of policies that says, no, we reject the idea that when you're in a depression, what you do is you cut more so that you put even more people into poverty. No, what you do, as they did, remember the New Deal, the Roosevelt New Deal, America, what did they do? They spent their way out of recession. That's how they created millions and millions of jobs. When you're in a recession, you don't dig a deeper hole, you stop digging. What we need to do is spend their way out of recession, spend more in public services, not less, create more jobs, pay more wages, collect more tax. When you collect more tax, then you can pay off debt, then you can spend more in services. That's the opportunity I think we've got in six weeks' time to vote for a political party as a socialist. As June's already said, I'm not a member of the SNP. I don't want to come across here as uh, a promoter of the SNP. I've got friends in the SNP, we have very good friends in the SNP. I've got loads of respect for a lot of SNP members. I walked alongside them in the Parliament for eight years and many of them are very good, um, if not socialists and certainly left of centre individuals. Some of them, some of them I've got to say, if they were living in England right now, they wouldn't be in any other party than the Tory party. <laughs> that's, that's the truth of the matter. And I can name them if you want, it's not a problem. But you're talking to somebody here who in the course of eight years in the Scottish Parliament moved several private members' bills to get rid of warrant sales, to introduce free school meals, to get rid of the public sale of air guns, to take the railways back into public ownership, to abolish the council tax and replace it with a fairer income-based tax. I've done all of those things, so I had to work with SNP members. I was able to look them in the eyes when I was asking for support for certain policies, so I can tell you who the Tories are. And I, I, I can tell you that that party has got its fair share of them. But, even though I'm a socialist, I am arguing that we should lend our vote to the SNP in six weeks time in order to keep the unity of the yes movement together, maximise the potential power of the yes movement in order to put independence right back onto the agenda. Take on that West monster. Tell them loud and clear, you thought you had this beat, you thought you could lie to us, you thought you could cheat us, you thought you could bully us. Hey, you thought you won. We won. We won. And that's what we have. I've told the story before, some of you might have seen it on the night of the referendum 
Gail and I were invited into the, the BBC studios to uh, discuss the, the way the vote was going. And by that time, it was clear that we'd lost. By that time, there was a few votes had come in, and we knew that we'd lost. And I was sitting round the table, and I that bloody John Weed sitting near me. Oh, <laughs> awesome. I mean, listen, I, when it comes to Tories, yeah, I, I don't particularly like them, I don't like their politics, but you know what, I've probably got more respect for them than I have for the new Labour crew, mm -hmm. because I know what they stand for. That new Labour crew are a bunch of charlatans, a bunch of chameleons. Here are my principles. If you don't like them, I'll change them. That's, that's their attitude. Their attitude is to do anything to get into office, do anything to get into power, and I despise that lack of principle. And I was sitting there, Reid was there, and we Glenn Campbell was doing the introduction and the wee teleprinter thing, the wee screen, and what came up was a tweet from Joanne Lamont. Congratulations to Scottish Labour on our marvellous victory tonight. Right? And I said there, and I'll repeat it again, they have to go and look at history. Go and look at Greek history. Go and look at where the term Pyrrhic victory was born. It was born from the Greek general who led his troops in the course of a war into one battle that he was determined to win. And he used up so many troops to win that one battle, he ended up losing the war. Labour, I said that night, have just won a Pyrrhic victory because they have lost the respect of their troops. They have lost the hearts and minds of the people of Scotland. They who were jumping about, hugging, with the millionaires and the billionaires and the Tories and the Lib Dems, they have lost their souls. And I think what's happened since then has shown quite clearly that that is the case. We have an opportunity here in six weeks time, not just to wipe out the blue Tories and the yellow Tories, but we've got an opportunity to wipe out the red Tories as well. Mm -hmm. To put the whole idea of independence right back onto the top of the political agenda. The whole idea of nuclear disarmament. The whole idea of rejecting austerity. The idea that you punish the poor for the bloody mistakes of the rich. No, we're not having it any longer. And that's why, even though I'm a convener of a socialist party, I'm appealing to the Greens, I'm appealing to the others and the, the left, please, in our Westminster election, we've only got one vote. It's only one vote. Please don't waste it. I looked at that poll there, the Ashcroft poll, a couple of weeks ago, that estimated that the route, the route could be as much as 53 seats out of 59 go to the SNP. Now, listen, I hope that happens. I'll, I'll be happy with 31. Because that we will have won Scotland. Because there is only 59, so if you win more than 30, you've won Scotland. But that poll done predictions on constituency by constituency. It predicted there is a possibility, and John Curtis repeated it two days ago, by the way, there is a possibility of a complete rout of the, of the, the Labour Party and the return of 53 SNP members of Parliament. One of the seats that that poll predicted that Labour would hold on to was East Renfrewshire, Jim Murphy. <laughs> now, now, here's the thing. On the basis of that poll, the prediction was that he would hold on to that seat by 1%. And on the basis of that poll, they predicted the Greens would poll 3%. Now, it doesn't take a mathematician to work out, does it, folks? Part of the Greens have they made up their mind yet whether they're going to stand in that seat. But my appeal to others to the left of the SNP, others who are part of the independence community, please, for this one election, I'm not saying give up your parties for goodness sakes, but for this one election, wouldn't it make sense that instead of standing that we all unite behind the biggest independence party and try and get the biggest vote for independence because how are you going to feel? How are you going to feel on an Edinburgh seat? How are you going to feel on a Glasgow seat? If you manage Greens poll 500, Socialist poll 500, oh great, look, we've got 500, oh brilliant. 
Labour hang on by 700. How are you going to feel? What you've done is you've actually undermined the independence movement. And quite frankly, quite frankly, some of it is a bit like a beauty contest, you know. Oh, look at, you know, we're standing because we want you to see us that we're still there. We know you're still there. You don't need to stand in the election for that. Next year, 2016, people have got two votes. Get two votes. Of course they should all stand. Yes, get in there and ask for one of those votes. But in the circumstances of a Westminster election where you've only got the one vote, please reconsider standing against the SNP. Why don't we unite behind that party with their eyes open? I don't want blind loyalty. I don't want saying, yeah, we're voting for the SNP and we don't mind that you want to remain a member of NATO. No, I don't want you to be a member of NATO. I don't say vote SNP and yeah, we agree with cutting corporation tax for big business. No, I don't want to cut corporation tax for big business. I know the weaknesses that exist within the SNP. I know that. Maybe they to tell me. But I also know that they are the only party that are currently equipped to beat the red, yellow and blue Tories. So please unite behind them. That's the lend your vote to the SNP basis. That's the basis of which the Hope Over Fear campaign is now mounted as many uh, meetings and rallies as, as possible. We've got one tonight here in Pennycook. We're then going to have a big uh, rally in George's Square, or Freedom Square as I like to call it, in Glasgow on the 25th of April, only a couple of weeks before the election. And our biggest appeal, our biggest appeal is to try and speak to A, the young people, many of whom never vote in elections but voted the referendum because they were motivated to do so. Their appeal to them is to use their vote and to vote for the SNP. And their second target audience, primarily, is the former Labour supporting audience, the working class, who, as June has said, have been used and abused as far as their trust is concerned over this last couple of decades. Uh, Jimmy Reid, the great Jimmy Reid, once said, when Blair was elected and dragged us into an illegal war and in increased tuition fees and cut taxes for the rich and deregulated the banks, he realised that the Labour Party had abandoned the working class. He said, I realised that the working class haven't left Labour. Labour have left the working class. That's the reality of the situation, folks. So, I would ask you to support this campaign through social media, through your speaking to your friends at work and communities, and to help us at the big event that we're planning on the 25th of April. And I'll leave my remarks at that and maybe take some questions and contributions before we have the best part of the day, which is Kevin uh, giving us some uh, music. So thanks very much for that. I managed to put my daughter to sleep there, so uh, <laughs> that wasn't bad. <laughs> who, who wants to ask a wee question to myself or to our merry point? Uh, Tommy, do you think that this austerity that Labour and Tory both support, because they've both voted for it, do you, uh, what do you think about it being like, a, a, the way I see it, it's like a sort of contract really, uh, to, you know, to make I actually think it's about making people poorer. Because when people are poorer, they're much more powerless. If they don't have enough to eat, they can't campaign and you know do stuff like that against inequality. So in many ways, I actually think it's a contract to do that. Because, and I would back that up by saying, I'm, I'm, I'm not asking a question, I'm saying what I think, but I just want to give opinion. But I mean, the way I see it is sort of like that is because the rich companies, the big companies, they're not paying their tax half the time. So I mean, it is total inequality. The banks and the big businesses are being let off by West, let off by Westminster from paying, you know, their huge tax bills a lot of the time. So there's, you know, and if they were paying that, maybe the rest of us wouldn't have to be picking up the bill. So what I'm saying here is, do you think there's some truth in, you know, a sort of agenda there? of austerity to actually make people poorer because they're more powerless, politically. Petra. Petra. Petra, I think you're absolutely spot on because when you reduce people and you reduce their willingness to fight, their spirit, yeah. 
they become much more pliable. Yeah. They, they become much more easily manipulated. Mm -hmm. I think of one wee statistic here. The, the TUC conducted a massive um, survey, opinion survey. 34% of the British population believe that um, something of the order of half of the benefits um, distributed in Britain are fraudulently claimed. 34% believe that the <coughs> half the benefits are fraudulently claimed. Now the reality is 0.7% of the benefits, not point, less than 1%. I've got to say to you, where does that then come from? If it doesn't come from the media, the politicians, what did they go on about it? Benefit fraud, benefit fraud, benefit fraud. But why are they not going on about tax fraud? Why don't we have the same hysteria? But yet the reality is 1.2 billion pounds, they reckon, is misclaimed, not 0.7% of the benefit bill. The amount of non-paid tax, 120 billion. 120 billion. Austerity? There's no need for austerity. Absolutely no need for austerity. If we just get the big businesses to pay their bloody taxes. We have no need for austerity. So, from my point of view, it's part and parcel, Petra, of having a more malleable community. If you're a big businessman, if you're a Tory, then what do you want? You want to be able to get people into zero hour contracts. You want to be able to promulgate this idea of, oh, what do you mean low pay? You should be lucky you've got a job. Yeah. yeah. As soon as you, soon as you hear anybody say, oh, we should fight for better wages. Oh, no, you can't fight for better wages. We, we need to be thankful we've got a job. Right? That's the type of spirit that they're trying to introduce. In the 1970s, we had over 13 million people, members of trade unions. Today, it's six and a half million. Um, we have, across the public sector, 60% of the public sector workers are in a trade union. The, the figure for the private sector, 16%. 16% of the private sector are in a trade union. Is it any wonder, therefore, the private sector can get away with what they're getting away with in terms of zero-hour contracts, lower wages, um, trying to keep people uh, on uh, contracts, which mean that they don't have a pension, that they, they don't have sick pay. They, these are the things that they're getting away with. Um, and I think it's all part and parcel of this austerity. And the, the one big thing, Peter, they got away with is, it was a bit like Tina. You remember Tina under Thatcher? There is no alternative, remember? Oh, there's no alternative. It's the same today. We're all in it together. What a lot of baloney. Yeah. What a lot of baloney. But that's the, the message. They put, oh, we're all in it together. Complete and utter nonsense. So we've got to fight austerity like every single ounce of our bodies, uh, Peter. Tell me, my name is June. wants to just say something. Yes, sir. I just want people to, to stop and actually take stock of what Petra has just said. Because sometimes I think people, are, I've got this bit of information, that bit of information, and, and they're not pulling it together. Now, we have huge corporations who are paying no taxes at all, so they're contributing nothing to society. Because ordinary working people are the ones paying their taxes. We are subsidising the family credit, the housing benefit. So who's sucking who dry here? You know? And, and I think sometimes people will pick up on one wee bit and another wee bit, but they're not actually putting it together and, and, and truly seeing what these huge corporations are doing and huge corporations that politicians have financial investment in and, and, and connections to. And I suppose for me, how blatant does it have to get for people to actually stand up and go, I mean, we keep hearing this, enough is enough. But seriously, you know, we, I could, I've, I've been really, really lucky, really fortunate. I have been in work all my life, all my life. I've never had to rely on benefit, benefits. But that's quite rare, I think. If I am paid off, and by the way, the, the, the area that I work in, none of our jobs are safe. If I'm paid off tomorrow and I go down to the job centre, I'm being treated as someone who's sucking something from my country. And you pay any the tax all the Yeah. Way. You know, we, it, it's like a double whammy with the, with the big corporations. They're not 
they're not contributing to anything and they're taking out and I completely agree with you, Petra. I, I am beginning to think this is an absolute plan. Yes. They're going to tread people into the ground that people will grab a zero hours contract. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been reading up on, on things and whatever, and, and, and people reflecting back to folks standing in George Square and, and places in America, and a truck comes along, and there's huge numbers of people. You know, right, I'll have you, 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 and you for, for a pittance. Yeah because the, the, the other option is nothing, absolutely nothing. And I think another thing people don't reflect on is we, we talk about the physical damage this is doing to people. I think there is a huge concerted attack on people's mental health. And once you rip somebody's mental health away from them, that is their foundation for, for dealing with anything that comes along. Is it breaking their spirit? Absolutely. Hi Tommy, how are you? Um, I'm over from Belfast today. Yay. And basically <laughs> what it is, you know, we Westminster just don't want us, full stop. We have terrorists, bigots and lunatics in power of the country. <laughs> and a lot of my friends knew I was coming over to see yourselves today. I joined the SNP as a lot of my friends did because we're totally disillusioned with politics in Northern Ireland. What can we do in Northern Ireland to lend our support to the Scottish people for independence? Because we have no SNP candidate, we have no socialist candidate, we've got the DUP bigots and have no time for Roman Catholics, we've got Sinn Féin terrorists, no time for the Protestant people. It's all about religion and you're the one side or you're the other side and that's how they vote. Where, where the middle classes have been totally abandoned where I'm a Roman Catholic living in a Protestant area. I have no MP to, if my water doesn't work, I have no MP to come out to my house or something happens in my area because I'm the wrong side of the blanket and it's vice versa for friends of mine that live in other areas. So we're just totally disillusioned and we, as a lot of my friends, want to lend our support to you guys and hope that you guys get your independence. What can we do in Ireland to support you guys? Charlotte. Charlotte. Um, Charlotte, it's a, it's a huge question in itself because mm -hmm. you know you, you, you asked it, the first question about what you can do to support us getting our independence, and, and I suppose what you're doing just now is great. You know, you joined the SNP, you're over, and you're showing your physical support, voicing your support in Northern Ireland is, is I think, fantastic and very, very helpful for us. Um, it seems to me that most people in Northern Ireland are probably recognising the fact that Westminster, Disney want them, that, <laughs> yeah. that, that, that Westminster... Um, they hate us as much as they do yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. If it would, if you had oil, they would have a different attitude. Oh, yeah. right? yeah. See, we have you, nothing if you, if to do with them. Exactly, exactly. You, you are an example of, of what would happen to us if we didn't have oil. This is what they want us, right? Um, what I, I like happens, for instance, you look, we came to the bedroom tax, you know, the, the Northern Ireland Assembly said, hey, we're, we're, no, we're not implementing it, you know, you need to give us extra grant because we're not implementing it. Now, personally, that's what the Scottish Parliament should have done at the start. However, they've ended up having to do that because of the movement from below saying, hey, wait a minute, you're not a victim of the disabled for, for the homes just because Westminster wants to introduce austerity. And I think what And they're fighting us one point two million pounds a day for doing it. Exactly. We're looking after our own people. Exactly. We're getting fined one point two million pounds a day all public a day because Sinn Fein says, No, hold on, we have to look after the disabled people, we've got to look after this, that, the other in our own country and now we're gonna lose our budget. We have no we've no money. You know what I mean? And you think that there's Northern Ireland's parts of Belfast quite similar to Glasgow, like really, it's, it's bad. It, I suppose, um, Charlotte, it's a whole different discussion, it's a, a very, very big discussion that has to be had. Um, if I was a Catholic in Northern Ireland, I would probably be looking for a class solution, but it would probably be a class solution that was based on uniting that Ireland but you see, the you know, problem I, I, I think that what it was, we're talking about like a middle class Catholic wants to give support the SNP and support mm -hmm. you guys here because I'm not a Republican. I don't agree with Sinn Féin. 
and they, they, they're not speaking for me. So what can, is there anything we can do? I, I, I think, well, I, personally my attitude to politics mm -hmm. has always been to try and unite working class people, whether it's Catholic, Protestant, black and white. The, 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 the biggest divide the ruling class has always had is petty division. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, they love it when we all fight among yes, ourselves, yeah. because then they get count the money in the bank without any bother. Um, I, I think we have to try and unite working class people mm -hmm. across, um, whether it be boundaries of, of class, or whether it's race, whether it's colour. Personally, I think it would be hypocritical for me to argue for Scotland to have the democratic right to be a nation and not to recognise the right for Ireland to be a nation. Um, I think Northern Ireland was a creation from British imperialism. Um, I don't think it had anything other than imperial interests when it was first created. Um, and I just wonder how long it's going to last before the demographics of the situation mean that it's going to be a united island again. I, I, now, the nature of that united island then is going to have to be a battle because <laughs> We're in, all the south, over here. <laughs> well, in, the, in the south of Ireland, I'm afraid, they're implementing a lot of austerity measures. They're doing everything the European mm -hmm. Union's asking them to do in terms of cutting budgets. There's big fights down there against water charges and everything like that. So that there's a lot of turmoil there. But I think the logic of the situation as far as Ireland is concerned, I can't see a long-term future yeah. that doesn't recognise that Ireland is an island. Um, and that they should be united as an island. Personally, um, Scotland has the history of being an independent nation. Mm -hmm. Ireland has the history of being an independent nation, and I think that's going to be the route. Now, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. But historically, uh, I think it will develop uh, over the next few generations. Certainly, sure. Scotland and the independence movement, you guys have a huge support in Ireland. Really, really good. Connecting with some of us on mm -hmm. Facebook. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can. Yeah. I just keep that going, and because I know that I mean, on some on my Facebook page, I've got quite a few people from Wales who are just amazing. Mm -hmm. The stuff that they they tweet, the stuff that they do, and support of, and I find that really comforting. And I hope that the Welsh people who are on my Facebook get get the same back. Mm -hmm. And it's about talking and whatever, and, and I actually would like to touch on something um, that I didn't think I would say um, today. For me, one of the most amazing things that happened throughout the referendum, we, we had quite a divide in Scotland as well with certain factions, sectarianism, mm -hmm. not, you know, to a point what I watched the Yes Movement do was incredible because it built bridges. I have seen people come together that before the referendum probably wouldn't have sat down at the same table. Now it's not on the same scale as the, the issues that these have faced. Um, and I've got a lot of English friends who, who, are, who are actually very envious of what's happened in Scotland. And what I try and describe to them is, or, or I describe the referendum to them, and they just wish that something like that would happen down England. Something so big that people put these kind of differences aside and have came together. As I say, I have, I've, without going into detail, because I can't, I have sat down with people at a table that for very personal reasons I would never have sat down with before and that was because of the referendum and that's because of our passion and we have a shared vision and we want what is best for Scotland. I wish that I could hand you an event like that mm -hmm for you to run with, but for me, I have saw a massive transformation in Scotland, both in terms of bringing different groups of people together who could never have sat and had that 
these kind of conversations and also a massive, massive awakening in Scotland. I think the most dangerous thing for politicians from Scotland is we are informed people now. And I think that is a massive danger to every politician. I don't care if you're a Tory, you're, you're Labour, I don't even care if you're Solidarity. I will keep myself informed, I will keep my eye on the ball, I will watch and I will listen and I will hold you to account if you are going off from what you're telling me is the ethos and the heart of your political party. So. I'm going to take a few more questions. I'm, I'm going to try and be um, less verbose and answer them because I've got Kevin in the wings waiting to come on and play a few numbers. So um, there, there was just, I saw something. Uh, sorry, uh, thanks, Tommy. My name's Jim. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you and June for a very inspiring motivation talk this afternoon and for focusing our eyes on a very big prize, which is a real prize and an achievable prize. I wondered if uh, I could ask your thoughts on the possibility in the future uh, in uh, an independent Scotland, what your thoughts might be on how real it would be to dismantle the SNP, what the possibility might be that the SNP would break up as a natural party, allowing all of us then to go to our natural homes. Um, have you any thoughts at all on that? One of the reasons, Jim, that I hope we don't just have 31 seats is because that would be an absolute disaster for Labour. But my worry is that you would still have some Neanderthal people in there saying, oh, well, it was bad, but we can still recover. See if it's 50, 53. The Labour Party is finished, finished as an entity, and it will be forced to reform. And the reformation, I hope, will take the shape of the spirit, the hopes, the aspirations of the founders of the Labour Party and the trade union movement. The idea of liberation, the idea of equality, the idea that public ownership, redistribution of wealth, people all having a fair say in society. Those were the principles of the Keir Hardys of the world, the John McLeans of the world, the Jimmy Maxtons of the world. These are the people who have been damned by the Scottish Labour Party's attitude, and obviously the UK Labour Party, but that, that's a, a different matter altogether. The Scottish Labour Party should be ashamed of what they've done, Jim. I think in an independent Scotland, what will happen is the trade union movement, those of us who are to the left of the political spectrum, those who believe in fundamental redistribution of wealth, we will have to forge a political message via a new body, a new vehicle. And the SNP won't any longer be able to keep itself together, because the SNP, let's face it, is a bit like the Big Ben Party, because it has socialists in it and it has Tories in it. That is acceptable just now because they have the one aim, independence. Once they get independence, will Fergus Ewan be able to agree with Bill Kidd? Will Nicola Sturgeon be able to agree with Stuart Stevenson? You know, th these people are at opposite ends of the political spectrum, but just now they're held together by that one aim towards independence. I think there will be a massive realignment and political allegiances in an independent country. By the way, I think it'll be dead exciting. Yeah. I think it'll be very uplifting. I think we will be an educated nation, as, as June has just said there. We're no taking on board everything we've learned in the last couple of years, and then we're going to go back to sleep again. <laughs> we're taking on everything we've learned, and then we're going to apply it. We're going to, we, we, we've now discovered the social media, for instance. One of the reasons the mainstream <laughs> media, in my opinion, doesn't have the influence it used to have, it's precisely because people have found the social media. They, they don't need to rely on the BBC to tell you what they think. You can actually find out for yourself. You know, middle class people paying other middle class people to tell them that the working class are to blame for everything. You know, that's what the BBC's whole ethos was about. Well, no, we don't have to accept that any longer. So I think, Jim, it'll be very, very interesting in the I think it'll be completely aligned.
Or what I'm hearing you saying is we are not dependent on what the SNP do. The answer to you know how a new Scotland would be aligned actually lies within. What Junior said there, you know, it's, it's, this isn't about the SNP. This is about the Scottish people. I, I've got to say, you know, <laughs> I'm asking people to lend their vote to the SNP. I get I get a lot of people on the left saying, oh, you're giving the SNP a left cover, you're, you're, you're letting them off the hook and think, you know, and I, I, people criticise us because usually when it comes to elections, I'm the very one that's fighting for the socialist cause and I'm waving the socialist banner, right? Sometimes when things become unique, you need to change. You know, if, if this was just an ordinary run of the mill election, that's probably what I would be doing. But it's not an ordinary run of the mill election, it's a completely unique election. But here's the other side of this equation. If we do convince the Scottish people in six weeks' time to vote SNP en masse, SNP is then going to have to show us the colour of their money, so to speak. Because if the SNP turn round in six weeks' time and say, oh, that's great, thanks a lot. Oh, by the way, Westminster's told us that we've got another £30 billion pounds worth of cuts to implement. Nothing we can do, you know, we have to implement these cuts. I think they are going to lose support like snow off a proverbial dink. <laughs> and the problem they're going to have is there's a Scottish election in a year's time. <laughs> so we could force the SNP to take a very combative position. As I've said umpteen times, we want an SNP that becomes a party of defiance, not a party of compliance as far as Westminster cuts are concerned. We don't want them to just say, oh, the cuts will be better because we're implementing them. No, they'll know. If an elderly person loses their home help, a, a child loses his nursery place, a child loses his music lesson, a disabled person loses their disabled club, does not matter whether it's the Tories Labour or SMB that's doing it? They're still losing it. And that's what we have to try and highlight, I think. Uh, my name is Jean, and I'm originally from Glasgow. I've lived in Edinburgh many years, so it's capital punishment. But the point is, I came from a long line of Labour supporters. My father, grandfather, and everybody worked in the shipyards. And so my family, I'm the oldest of nine, of the four brothers and four sisters, and we were all Labour supporters. And the referendum changed everybody's mind a bit. And I represent myself personally, some of the so-called minority groups. I'm a woman, I'm disabled, I'm a pensioner, and was a Labour supporter. So <laughs> the point about that is, there was a fear factor. And even talked to my brothers and sisters, they were saying, no, 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 we always voted Labour. Because Labour gave us what was called the hope and the belief that things would be for them, and they're now beginning to realise it's not. And, but the thing that was prevalent when you speak to anyone is the fear factor. And to remove that fear factor, there's a lot of explaining to do, and I used all of my so-called disabilities to try and convince people that it is important. But the fear factor still exists because I spoke to some older people the other day and they were saying, oh, but they're all the same. Politicians are all the same. And well, what makes you think this is going to be any different? And I said, because there is hope. That is what we've got now. It's hope that we never had. And there's a fear factor that there's a thing in the next six weeks we need to try and you know, dissipate because it still exists. And people with pensioners and disabled folk are still white. And when I asked the social work department last year to help me to get a downstairs toilet, I was told no, but you give me a commode and my living room beside the window. And I said, so I have to sit by my window. It's undignified to know that you're disabled, but sitting with that commode makes it worse. And the point about that is, if I believe there is hope, then we have got to convince other people. Jeannie just summed up uh, so eloquently the point I was making there earlier. It doesn't matter to Jean whether it's a Labour Council, Tory Council or SNP Council that says that we can't afford the downstairs toilet. You know, it's a fact of life that we can afford nuclear weapons but we can't afford the downstairs toilet for a disabled citizen. Well, that's not good enough. That's not the type of Scotland I want to live in. And, and that, that's the hope we need to raise up a better school. I had to then raise the money and get it myself. To, to enable me to stay in the same community that are very supportive to me, and I like to stay there and I want to be there till I die, but they were at the stage of, well, we could move around it. Like, where? 
we can't get your visitors to it. We can't afford to get your visitors to it. We'll give you a commode in that corner. And then my, my toilet's upstairs and I say, this is the truth, I say, who's going to empty this commode? Shh. We can send in a cure oh. twice a week. Twice a week, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As you know. Um, that's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's the truth. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, just, just following from your, the previous point, um, uh, my concern was that what happened to Quebec might happen to us because they did the very same thing in their equivalent of the SMP after they lost their referendum. And it took 20 years before a socialist politician got any office. So it actually killed the left. I just wonder and hope that that doesn't happen to us. I'm hopeful it won't happen to us because, mm. as you know, Quebec had a number of referendums and every time it got closer and closer, we are not going to have a number of referendums. We're only going to have another one. And we're going to win it. And, uh, in, my, in my opinion, we have a situation here where despite the bullying, Despite the uh, bribing, despite the lies, 1.6 million people said, no, I'm going for this. But that 1.6 million, if you look deeper, who was it? Predominantly young, predominantly working class. Yeah. They are the future. Yeah. They are the future. And they're not going to change their minds. If anything, they're going to become more convinced. What I think has happened, particularly among the pensioners, I think there's been a shift in opinion after the referendum where they're saying God, we thought this was going to be a disaster we, we, we think we've been lied to look at all these promises we were given there's been a massive shift that's why Edinburgh University is now reporting 69% in favour of independence so I, I think if there was a position where we were having referendum after referendum um, and it was becoming more and more divided then we could go down that road I don't think we're going to go down that road and also I think there are a lot more socialists in Scotland than there are but that's a, 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 good, a good point. I think we've got a communitarian basis there. Quebec, which has no history of being a country, but well, Scotland is one of the ancient countries in the world. Well, that, that's, that's a difference. It's not a debt comparison, but it's just a, a thought that yeah. they, they, they voted for their equivalent of the SMP. Well, I think that's and, the and that's what they basically became a single party state right. after that. I'm, I'm, I'm nodding at Kevin to get ready to get warmed up. Do you not think that one of the things that the Tony Blair left this country was a fringe mm -hmm. I think it's like, I'm all right, Jack. <laughs> I'm all right, but I am. I'm no rocking the boat. And just sometimes you feel like saying to people, we're the ones that allow them to do us. Mm. We gave giving them the power. And I think that Scotland now and it's woke up and I'm the same, I joined the SAP, but I know who do their stalls, but it's for, for freedom. I'm the same, I didn't even play like SAP, so this and that. But I mean, go to, to, to the children. I mean, I, I get that, that on that Friday, got to pick up my granddaughter from school, and all they be kids, I mean, it's just, and I think that folk have got to realise that their vote matters, every single vote counts. Yeah. They don't take for granted what the polls say, we've got to all get out there and vote. If you don't mind, unless there's any burning points or questions, we can do that as the last yeah. contribution before we ask Kevin to, to give us some. Yeah, I think Beverly has very, very um, well summed things up there that we can't rely on what the polls are telling us. They're telling us that there's going to be a wipeout. Brilliant! But it's not going to happen unless people turn out. It's going to be a wipeout unless it's a turn out. So we need to make sure every single vote is a prisoner. Uh, we need to try and make sure that every single, particularly young person, because whether we like it or not, the elderly tend to use their vote. Labour still has a latent support among the elderly. We have to break into that. One way to combat that, I think, is by getting the young people who are much more enthusiastic about the idea of change and the hope that is there, hope over fear is what we're trying to promote here. Um, so I think you're absolutely right to Beverly. I think the legacy that we have to pass on to our kids is that, see if you live in something called society, 
then it means you look after one another. Mm. You know, they, they were not just all individuals. You know, Thatcher wanted that, didn't she? She, she I remember reading about a lecture she gave at the Royal Geographical Dinner in 1989 where she made her famous speech, there is no such thing as society, just a collection of individuals. Well, I beg to differ. I think there is such a thing as society. There is such a thing as community. There is such a thing as solidarity, social solidarity that makes you care about your neighbour, about your friends, about your relations, about the elderly, about the disabled. We care because we're all human beings and that's what makes us social. So I think that's the, the way we're going to build this new Scotland, Beverly, and uh, the, 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 first, the first step towards building it is definitely six weeks time, is get a massive SNP majority. Oh, I've to mention merchandise. Uh, just, uh, John, could you stand up at the back and everybody look there? Uh, something inside so small. I still, yes. All over fear. There are t shirts for sale. T shirts for sale at the end. And the good thing is, the good thing is we, we, we looked on, online at a lot of the merchandise for the Yes community. We thought it was up expensive, so they're only a fiver, which is very, very good compared to a lot of other But listen, I'm now going to hand you over to Kevin. Kevin, do you need an introduction before you get strung up? Are you